In just two years, our world has changed, certainties stripped away, faith-shaking things we never imagined could be. And now, as we slowly unlock, still in the shadow of pandemic, we find freedom, a mass of future where peace is fragile, life is still too easily lost, and millions are displaced by war. Never, amid so much uncertainty, have we been so sure that this is a time to seek God's heart for this world. This is a time to reimagine Bible mission. We are already reaching communities in war-torn Ukraine with humanitarian and spiritual aid. But imagine if you had the resources to help those who come here as refugees. And imagine if you were equipped to help others already living in your community who are dealing with trauma. What if you could offer them Bible mission that speaks into their suffering? Navigating trauma is a way for people to feel the Spirit of God and to hear God's voice in their hurt, in their grief, and in their pain. So it's mind, body, and spirit. Imagine if you could reach families now free from lockdown bubbles with fresh ways to gather around the Bible and discover how it speaks into these difficult times and transforms their lives. It's a Bible that stays open in the middle of your living room or your bedroom and it invites the whole family, not just to read scripture, but to actively engage in it no matter where you are in your faith. And what if you could discover more about the Bible, how to read it, what it says about your life, and feel equipped and confident to share it with those around you? At Bible Society, we'd love you to join us in engaging with Scripture, understanding our neighbourhoods and serving our communities in this new post-pandemic world. So together, let's reimagine Bible mission. To all of those of you who are joining us virtually, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Noemi. I am a mission specialist at Bible Society, and I'm going to be guiding us through the event today. Now, earlier today, this morning, we had what's called a National Parliamentary Prayer Breakfast. In fact, probably most of you in this room have come straight from there. Um, but the Prayer Breakfast is an annual event which gathers together politicians and church leaders to pray and worship together. And it's a highlight of the year, isn't it? It certainly is for me. And it's an opportunity to then channel and garner conversations, rich conversations, to follow up in seminars. And this is one of them. So a huge welcome to all of you. It's really delightful to see so many people here. And I know there are many more of you joining us online. Now, we have a packed schedule ahead of us. So buckle up. We're going to be moving really swiftly through the, last, through the next hour and a half. Um, to unpack and explore this topic of discipleship and how to refocus Bible mission in a changing world. And we do find ourselves, don't we, in a changing landscape. If you were here a few minutes ago, you'll have seen, and hopefully online, you'll have seen the video as well. There's this general sense, there's this general feeling, isn't there, of having had the rug pulled from under our feet over the last two years through the pandemic. The cost of living is soaring. There is war on European soil, there is a constant influx of refugees from very countries, and the list goes on. So all of these things conjure up, raise up many questions for the church today. And those are some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. How do we rethink discipleship in a changing world? Now, we at Bible Society conducted a survey among church leaders in the UK in the autumn last year to really tackle this issue a bit further and to ask them, Okay, what are some of the challenges which the church faces today? And this survey really came out of, as a result of, the pandemic. And the findings revealed some issues that we were expecting, some issues relating to mental health, maybe stemming from loss and isolation and bereavement. But there was also one central thing that kept coming back and back across all the leaders who were asked, and it was a sense of a lack of discipleship for followers of Jesus today. There's a sense that the routines and the patterns of discipleship for Christians have really been challenged and shaken over the last couple of years. And this is where we, Bible Society, need and want to step in. Discipleship is a central, is, is at the very center of what we believe. We are passionate about equipping and discipling the next generation. 
There's a lot to unpack. It's a rich conversation. There are a lot of layers. And we're going to be trying to make a start on that today. So we have an amazing lineup of guests today who will be offering us a range of various insights, various perspectives coming from diverse backgrounds, even from abroad. We've got domestic and abroad perspectives. And they're going to be speaking into this theme of discipleship. And what does discipleship mean today? Um, they're going to be highlighting both some of the challenges that we face, but also hopefully we're going to be looking at maybe some of the openings that are also before us as followers of Jesus today for discipleship. We're going to be having a theological reflection that is going to be grounding us. We're going to have a series of interviews as well. And we're also going to be having an interactive discussion with you, the audience. And that's actually where I want us to start. We're going to dive straight in. So I want us to answer a question. I want everyone here, whether it's online as well, so you can do this online or in person, to start to think about the question, what are the most pressing issues for the church today? So if you get your phones out, I can see that there's clearly a slide that's come up. Come up. So get your phones out. And if you go onto your web browser and you type in slido.com, we're going to be using that software to gather some of the answers. And you'll be submitting your thoughts on there. So go onto slido.com. When you get onto there, you'll be asked for a password. And so enter the code Bible Society in one word, no spacing. Bible Society. So slido.com, Bible Society. And when, once you're in, you'll see the question, what are the major challenges for discipleship in England and Wales today? Now, I'm well aware this is a very broad question, so no biggie, but have a think. You're going to have about, I'm going to allow one minute, one minute, 30 seconds, um, to have a think about it, okay? And so throughout the event, keep that browser open. You can come back to it. But start, but start to submit your answers. answers. And so what, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to start to see a word cloud appear. appear. And that's, that's going to show up some of the responses. responses. Now, we're, so not, we're going not going to spend some time, time now looking, looking at that. that. We'll, we'll be coming back, back to it later, later in the program. And there'll, there'll be a, be a panel, panel to start to explore some of the responses that we get from you, the audience. This is a really important exercise. We really want to hear from you. I'm going to stop talking, let you concentrate for about a minute. Everyone's concentrating very hard. Complete silence in the room. Okay, I'm going to allow 30 seconds. You can come back to it. What are some of the major challenges for discipleship in England and Wales today? Okay, right. I'm going to hand over to Professor Paul Williams. Paul Williams is the General Secretary, the Chief Executive of the British and Foreign Bible Society. And Paul, you are going to be saying a few words before we then hear from Professor David Ford, OBE, Christian theologian. And we're going to be drawing upon the richness of Scripture to explore and rediscover the biblical foundations of discipleship. So, Paul, you are very welcome. Welcome to the stage, Paul. This is my cue for Paul to come up. Um, and, and, Paul, we're going to be learning a bit more, aren't we, as, uh, as well, about the community of faith that is so richly described in John's Gospel. So, Paul, welcome. Over to you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's really good to see everyone at this um, Bible Society seminar following the prayer breakfast. Uh, it was great to pray together um, uh, in that space of Parliament, wasn't it? And, and I think that what it does it, it, when we're in a space like that, uh, whether uh, you can imagine it easily enough if you weren't there, is that we think about leadership. And we, and we think, think about, about the next, next generation, generation of leadership. leadership. And, we and we think, think about, about the quality of leadership character. character. And, we and we begin, begin to ask ourselves, uh, who, who are our leaders and who can lead us to a better place? place. And, and of course, course the, the core, core answer, answer to all of those questions, questions is, is first about learning to follow Jesus Christ. Christ. And that, that is, is the theme, theme of this seminar, because we believe that there is something of a crisis uh, in the church, in our generation, 
around this theme of discipleship. And so that's why we wanted to give space to talk about it. And we're absolutely delighted to have uh, David Ford, OBE, come and speak to us. Uh, David, uh, you've read his bio. He is a Regis Professor of Divinity Emeritus at the University of Cambridge. He's had a very illustrious career. Um, but what I want to do uh, in the one minute left before he comes and speaks to us is to encourage all of you uh, to get a copy of this book. Uh, this is David's theological commentary on John. And it's the product, the fruit of 20 years reflection by one of this country's leading biblical theologians. And what is remarkable about this book, which I am just enjoying so much, I know several people with different levels, some of them with no prior theological background, are just loving the accessibility of the scholarship in this book. Um, John's, John's gospel, gospel, of course, is, the, is classically the gospel that we want to give, isn't it, to people who are coming to faith. You know, if you're, if you're wondering, well, what, what do we give out at an evangelistic rally? Often it's John's gospel, because we know it's so um, somehow sort of connecting and accessible. Um, and yet there's such depth. And the amazing thing about this commentary, don't just look at it or put it on your shelf, but actually dwell in it and read it, and get your different uh, English versions out, and dig into this extraordinary text, because it absolutely rewards the time. Um, I have loved, I've been reading John and reading different uh, commentaries on John for several years. Um, David and I share a passion for Leslie Newbegin's uh, commentary, but this is a really special piece of work, and you will find it enormously enriching, no matter how much biblical scholarship background you may come to, uh, it will be accessible to you. So let me encourage you with that. And therefore, as I engaged with, with this and saw the way in which the theme of followership and discipleship was drawn out, I couldn't think of anyone better to talk to us than Professor David Ford. Would you come, David? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed, Paul. It's rarely that one gets that sort of uh, <laughs> introduction for a book. <laughs> and, but, but actually, that those 20 years spent on uh, the commentary have been one of the most extraordinary times in, in my life. I mean, and, and the amazing thing for me was that uh, every rereading of John seems to bring more. And there were more and more surprises. Like chapters I thought I knew in advance, you know, had surprises, surprises, you know, as, as, as one got into it. And, uh, and I, I came at the, the end actually thinking that the purpose of a, a commentary like that is really to try to turn everyone into habitual rereaders of the Gospel of John, so that you too have the same sort of experience of the sheer abundance. You know, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. But what I've been asked to write to talk about is really what what wisdom can we in 21st century Britain learn about discipleship from the Gospel of John? And I want to connect that question with the first words Jesus speaks in the Gospel of John. Think of it, the Word of God. These are the first words that the Word of God gives in the Gospel of John. And they are also a question. And it's what he asked his first two disciples. So this is the question at the root of their discipleship. Disciple, of course, simply means learner. And good learning depends, as Jesus well knew, on good questions, generative questions, deep questions, the sort of questions that ideally lead you further and further into the truth, into reality, into who you are, and can accompany you all through life. And this first foundational question of Jesus to his disciples is that sort of question. I think it's worth asking this question to ourselves daily, maybe even more than once daily. <laughs> and what is the question? Jesus' question is, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? 
What are you searching for? What do you really, really want? What do you hope to find and experience? What do you desire? That the Greek is just two words, tit, say tighty. That's my Irish Greek pronunciation. Um, <laughs> And the, the, that verb, zetain, is a strong word. It runs all through John's Gospel, along with words with similar sorts of meaning, seeking, searching, wanting, desiring. And that is central to the Gospel. And then, as now, life can be understood as a drama of desire. Desire goes to the heart of discipleship, because, of course, that's where our hearts are set. And it also goes to the heart of a worth, worthwhile life and of the common good that we were talking about this morning in, uh, in the prayer breakfast. Uh, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He wants abundant life for all. Uh, I remember when we were working on the Vision for Education for the Church of England, which was published eventually as Deeply Christian, Serving the Common Good, an engagement with a head teacher whose, whose school had her 1010 ethos, she said. It was John 1010. You know, life in all its abundance. Come to give life in all its abundance. And I visited the school, and my goodness, it, it, it was built around being a sign of abundant life for all. And <clears throat> Jesus demonstrated this, of course, too. He did signs of abundant life for all, all that wine at the, at Cain, the wedding in Cana, for everyone there, not just for his own disciples. You know, all the feeding of the 5,000, all those healings, and, of course, all that teaching, the meaning, the truth, the purpose, the making deep sense of life. And at that great festival of Sukkot, tabernacles or booths in Jerusalem, which centered on harvest and water, in other words, life, and on light, meaning. Uh, Jesus cries out to all the crowd, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Jesus is about desire. And a huge amount of our personal lives and our culture is about desire. Life is full of choices, decisions, hopes, fears, things we want and things we don't want. The need to prioritize this activity over that or this relationship over that. Possibilities for joining this or that group or movement and orienting our lives in one direction or another. It goes on and on. There's never been, I think, a culture in history more saturated by so many stimuli to desire through so many media. Click on this, vote for this, buy this, eat this, drink this, like this, watch this, read this, learn this, believe this, protest against this, visit this, imitate this, be like this, follow this person, and so on. They're all about desire, aren't they? The, the, the people and organizations that are most successful in stimulating our desires are among the wealthiest and most powerful in the world. And of course, our desires can go wonderfully well or disastrously wrong and everything in between as well. So Jesus asks, what are you looking for? Now, if we jump, I, I'm assuming, by the way, in this, that all of you have read the Gospel of John at some point, <laughs> that, uh, that if we jump to John chapter 20, near the end of the Gospel, Jesus asks that core question about desire again, only now with an important difference. In perhaps the most moving scene in the whole Gospel, when the crucified and resurrected Jesus meets with Mary Magdalene outside his tomb. Mary Magdalene, remember, had seen him die. She is weeping as she searches for the dead body of Jesus. And she imagines him, of course, to be the gardener. One of the most wonderful commentaries on John that I found was Margaret Daly Denton's commentary entitled, Supposing Him to be the Gardener. <laughs> it's the Earth Bible commentary about it. You know, creation and so forth as well. But Mary meets Jesus anonymously and 
her, his, one of his questions to her is not what are you looking for, his question to his first disciples, but who are you looking for? So the what, she's been looking for a dead what, and she finds a living who. <laughs> the, so the fulfillment of her desire is this person, Jesus and her living, ongoing, permanent relationship of mutual understanding, trust, and love with him. The who question is always utterly central in John's gospel. All those I ams, he is the fulfillment of her desire. Now, what's at the heart of this ongoing relationship? John's Gospel uniquely gives what you might call a course in discipleship in chapters 13 to 17, those which are often called the farewell discourses of Jesus on the night before his death. And discipleship, I came to the conclusion after 20 years, you, you would say, yes, it, why did it take you 20 years to get there? Um, <laughs> but, um, but that really what it's about is we learn, we love, and we pray. We have to be learners, lovers, and prayers. That's what discipleship is about. And there's wave after wave. John teaches in waves. Wave after wave of teaching on these in John 13 to 17. And what is said is strikingly, as Paul said so well at the beginning, you know, both very accessible to beginners and at the same time continually challenging to the more experienced. I've been more and more challenged by John's gospel as those 20 years went on. Uh, but of course, as Paul said, it's, it's a gospel you can put into the hand of somebody new to the faith or just interested. And so, if you look at those three, we're promised the Holy Spirit to lead us into all the truth. So there's no end to our learning as disciples. No end to it. It goes on and on and on. All the truth. We are called to be friends of Jesus and told to love as he has loved, to live lives of inspired love and service. And of course, there's no end to that either. The superabundance of this life of being loved and loving is infinite because God is love. The archetypal disciple in John's gospel, to whom the writing of the gospel is ascribed, is simply called the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I think he's anonymous because we're all meant to share in that core identity of being loved and loving. So that's the love. And then there's prayer. We're invited to pray in remarkable ways in the farewell discourses, confidently, daringly, and above all, in the name of Jesus. Now, what does that mean? I think it means that in, it's to be in line with who Jesus is and what he desires. So we have to get to know him better and better if we want to pray. <laughs> that that's what we're called into. And prayer, I think, is the depth of the other two. It's the depth of the learning and the depth of the loving. And there is, of course, no end to prayer, to worship, to praise, to use John's favorite word, glorifying, glorifying God. Glory, this is a gospel of glory. I wish we had several hours. <laughs> now, all of this, the truth, and learning, the loving, the praying, the glorifying, culminate in what I have come to consider the most important, most profound, and most inspiring chapter in the Bible, the prayer of Jesus in John 17. And in those 20 years, I mean, I, I came back to this again and again and again and felt that this is the, the, the core depth in the Gospel of John is summed up somehow by Jesus in this most intimate relationship, the key relationship of his life with his father and then shared with his, with his disciples. And what it gives is the final, ultimate desire of Jesus as he prepares to lay down his life in love. 
how, now, how does it happen in the prayer? Again, one wishes for several hours, but the, first he opens up the intensity of divine glory and eternal life. Glorifying glory come five times in the first five verses. <clears throat> Next, Jesus prays to his Father for his disciples, leading up to the essence of their discipleship as learners. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And he also then leads into them having a mission of love, like he does. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And later, of course, those words are taken up in chapter 20 when the resurrected Jesus appears to his disciples, breathes the Holy Spirit into them and says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. I love that. What that does is it sends you back to reread the whole gospel endlessly because you need to know how Jesus was sent and who Jesus is and so forth and go deeper and deeper and deeper into that. But it also leads you forward, the as. You're not to do exactly the same as Jesus. You're not in first century Palestine. You have to endlessly improvise in the spirit, in our world, daringly imaginatively, lovingly, etc. That's, that's where we're, we're, we're sent from, from, from there. Um, but to get back to John 17, we then read in the last seven verses the extraordinary climax. Jesus prays for all of us who have come after. Listen to it. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me. As and in are two of the deepest theological words in John's gospel. You never come to the end of them. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire, fellow, that's the Greek word there, fellow, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you have loved me before the foundation of the world. This is the deepest love at the heart of our universe. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. And though these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. What a desire. What an invitation to discipleship, to live with Jesus a life whose overwhelming desire is for this unity in love with God and with each other for the sake of the world God loves. And that, of course, includes the whole of creation. Have I run out of my time, or do I have time for a footnote? Okay, okay, just one further thought, one further thought. <laughs> one of my great experiences in 2009, on the, about halfway through the writing of this, was I, I read through the whole of John's Gospel, that Richard Borkham, one of my favorite New Testament scholars in this country, and Richard Hayes, my favorite North American New Testament scholar, were visiting, were in Cambridge, Richard retiring from St. Andrews, Richard Hayes on sabbatical, and I invited them to read the whole of John with me, and we put... 
21 dates of three hours each between July and Christmas, and it was absolutely wonderful. And they're both very different New Testament scholars, but both deeply uh, you know, in faith and also really theologically engaged you know, in, in contemporary things. So it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But whenever they agreed about something, I thought they must be right. <laughs> and, the, the, and, and when they, when they came to John 17, they both agreed, this is a sort of improvisation on the Lord's Prayer. It's a midrash was the word they used, the Jewish term for, for that. A midrash on the Lord's Prayer. And it has changed the way I pray the Lord's Prayer. I'm sure many of you pray the Lord's Prayer at least once daily, uh, as I do. And this has really changed. So look, the, the practical suggestion for letting this prayer be really part of your lives is uh, pray it in the light of Pray the Lord's Prayer in the light of John 17. And of course, remember that little bit of Greek that I've been teaching you, that, that when it says, your will be done, the word will in Greek is thelema, which also means desire. So in other words, and it changes the feel somehow to say, your will, your desire to be done. You know, of course it's his will, but it's also his desire. And, and the desire draws us in to this extraordinary journey, life of discipleship. Thank you. Wow, wow, oh my goodness, David, thank you so much for such a rich, um, rich unpacking of John's Gospel and what we can learn from it about discipleship. I love that challenge that you've set to us. Where does our heart's desire, where is our desire? Who is it that we are looking for? And those are really um, challenging, thought-provoking questions when we have all of these distractions around that you mentioned. Um, what, how can the church encourage real-life witness, real-life discipleship in such a fractious noisy culture. So we're going to continue on in that conversation. I'm actually going to grab this mic, which is still on, um, because we're going to spend the remainder of our time in discussion with various guests, both from home and overseas, to really gather insights from different cultures and generations. So I'm going to invite Matthias up to the stage. Matthias, please give him a round of applause. Matthias, is your microphone on? It should be. Yeah, it is. Okay. okay. Now, welcome, Matthias. Thank you so much for joining us. You are the General Secretary, the Chief Executive of the Bible Society in Slovenia. In Slovenia, yes, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. You've come all the way from Slovenia with your wife. Welcome, Simona. Yeah. Oh, um, thanks for having here. us. It's Thank you so privilege, much. great privilege. Well, Matthias, I feel like we should start with you just giving us, in general, a bit of information about Slovenia, because I feel like I'm probably not the only person here who doesn't know a huge amount of it, Slovenia. So maybe okay. tell us about Slovenia. It's a tiny country in the central of Europe. Uh, it was part of uh, Yugoslavia, which some of you might remember, north western part of Yugoslavia. So we are bordering to uh, Italy on the west, Austria in the north, Hungary northeast, Croatia in the east, and we have a bit of Mediterranean. Uh, the population is two million people. And uh, yeah, we speak Slovenian language, which is Slavic, related to you know, Croatian, Serbian, Russian, Ukrainian. Mm, so yeah, we are a tiny nation, and also culturally we are kind of in a crossing between Central Europe and Eastern Europe, or Balkans, if you want. So, on a good day, we are both. On a bad day, we are neither. So, <laughs> that's what it is. Okay, thank you so much. And can you tell us a bit more about the church landscape, particularly in Slovenia? Um, yeah, the church landscape, I think, in, in broadly speaking, it's quite similar to, to, to here. It's a post-Christian society. Now, nominally, there would be like 60% of population would say they're Catholic, so that's, that's the predominant uh, religion. But uh, in practice, maybe 5% would be like church-going, practicing Christians. The rest would be cultural Christians, and uh, many of those wouldn't even believe in the existence of God or, or life after death and things like this. So that, that's, and then uh, there's a strong, I would say, agnostic or atheistic camp and then the Protestant camp is really small. It's 1%, and that would be mostly Lutheran in the Northeast. 
Yep. Okay, thank you. That helps give us a bit of a picture of yep. what, we, what we're dealing with in your context. Where we're coming, yeah. When we were talking a couple of weeks ago, you yep. also told me a bit about the fascinating history of the Bible and its role in the founding of the nation in Slovenia. Yes, that, that, that is quite fascinating, really. And we, we were discovering this yeah, not too long ago, but uh, basically Bible made us a nation and then Bible translation made us a nation. That, that, that's quite a statement. I, I could go on for a long time. But back in 16th century, uh, we got our first books by the reformers. We had strong reformation movement there. And uh, there, the, the main question the, the, the was, okay, we need to translate the Bible, but for whom and what language will we choose? So they chose a language which they called Slovenian, and it covered the territory which is nowadays Slovenia. Back then, it was three different countries or lands. Uh, and so this Bible, we, we had, we are a tiny, tiny nation, but we had a full Bible in 1584 in our language. And even then, then the counter-reformation came and uh, erased Protestantism, but they kept the Bible. The Catholics kept the Bible and it, that fixed our national identity. So really it, it was, we are a byproduct as a nation of a Bible translation. So it, it's a great story. Yeah. That, that is a great story. Now, we've seen, uh, we've talked about the impact that COVID has had on mm -hmm. discipleship within the church in the UK. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about the impact of the pandemic in Slovenia on the church? Uh, yes, I, I suppose it's similar. Of course, most of churches closed down and there, were, there, were, there was a need to discover, well, new ways of being church. And many churches resorted to some small groups and so on and so forth. And then, yeah, then also we as, as Bible society were starting to think, okay, what, what, what would it look like if we would uh, equip people uh, in a simple ways to, to, yeah, to, to meet in this, let's say, simple, small ecclesiastical forms and, and do discipleship together, learn together, be, be absorb the word of God together, like we just heard in, in, in this fashion, N not in academic, but in personal way, L letting the word of God impact us, each one of us where we are, and then simply share with each other. So this, th this is the kind of vision that was birthed out of this. But yeah, the, the, the situation was definitely difficult and the church attendance went down. And I don't think it will come back to what it was before. Yeah. You also mentioned to me, though, that there is hunger among a growing percentage of the population. Yes, yes, and th th that's, that, that's the thing that we discovered, actually, uh, from, from different constituencies, also from these, let's say, cultural Christians who belong to the church mo more in a, for out of cultural reasons, not, not for personal faith. But, but we've seen that there is thirst there, so we want it as a Bible society, as a mission-focused agency, we, want, we, we, we wanted to see, okay, how do we serve those? How do we help those? And we've seen, particularly in the Catholic Church, but other churches as well, there's a great need and, and space, yes, to, to form this simple, small, we would call Bible, we, we call them ecclesia, actually. That, that's the, the term my Catholic colleagues chose. Uh, small ecclesiastic formations, simple groups of Bible sharing and, and growing together because we find yeah, discipleship happens powerfully when, you know, go, just going back to this Jesus' word, like where two or three are gathered in my name, and we heard about how important this is, yeah, there I am in the midst of them. So learning, building church from bottom up, let, let, let's, let's put it this way. Community, yeah. community. Community, yeah, simple community. So you said, my passion is discipleship in a post-Christian society. So, yeah. so you've started to mention a little bit about that simple discipleship vision. Can you tell us a bit more about where you feel the role of the Bible Society fits into this context? Uh, yeah, like I said, we, we felt, well, well, we got some requests from the field, you know, and so, so we obviously saw, okay, there is hunger. So the, the way we, we, we started to approach this is to develop some tools and one of, one of these tools is actually here. It's an edition of New Testament. But the main point is that, that there's discipleship materials right there. It, it fits uh, partly also with a Catholic curriculum, but now done as simple Bible reading materials to be done in small groups in whatever ways. And then what we do is also we, we have basically like very simple seminars 
um, not so much teaching but modeling how a little group like that does function. And so we do this. Uh, um, my colleagues from Catholic Church, they would uh, gather groups. We do it online mostly. Uh, they would gather interested priests or interested catechists or, or lay people. And, uh, and yeah, and they, they would just experience this and there's, the response so far is really good. They say, wow, yeah, let, let's do this. Let, let's, let's start to do this simple but powerful Bible engagement. Yes, thing. because correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it, it came out in January. Yeah, year, this so is still quite to new, totally new. But yes. you've had amazing responses already. So very, far. very good, very yeah. good. Yeah. So later on, I'm happy, if, if anyone is interested, I'm happy to talk more about this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Do come up to Matthias at the end to, to ask him more about this. Now, lastly, finally, you are also part of the team who work on the first time common language translation of the New Testament. So can you tell us a bit more about this and what you hope the fruit of this translation will have in Slovenia? Mm, yeah, yeah th that's correct. I mean, we are a very small Bible society, so I do all kinds of jobs <laughs> in one day, like up to seven, I counted, I can do seven totally different jobs, but I, I do, I do Bible translation, it, it's my passion. I see Bible translation as a like really basic primordial mission endeavor because it's br bridging the gap from then there to here now, that language, that culture, this language, this culture, and especially this common language translation really wants to go, yeah, a bit further, wants to really talk to the, to the, to the, we, we want actually to be something that can be used by non-church people. So we avoid Christianese language, and, and, and that's difficult. When you start to go about it, it really is difficult. But we are, we are publishing it bits by bits, so there's some gospels are out there, and we, we've got some amazing feedback from young people. Uh, they say, oh, this really speaks to us, thank you so much. So yeah, we are somewhere, somewhere midway, but, but we see there's yeah, great mission, missional potential mm, in it. Absolutely, no, that's really encouraging to hear. Well, Matias, thank you so much. You're, you're you. actually gonna stay here because we're about to okay. have a panel so sit here, um, but it's so exciting to hear about the brilliant resources that you and your team have been working on. Mm -hmm. As we said, feel free to come at the end to flick through this, um, this New Testament and to speak to Matthias, so do ask him any questions. Now, as promised, we are now going to look at the Slido responses, so there's going to be a word cloud that pops up at some point, and I'm going to invite up David and Paul up again. And I'm also going to invite Dr. Hugh Osgood. Now, you are Dr. Hugh somewhere. Uh, there we go. <laughs> um, senior UK church leader and founding president of Churches in Communities International. So I'm going to actually move to make room for all of you to come up. You can start to come up now. And we're going to be looking to at the discussion that we were, um, we're going to be continuing that discussion. We're going to be looking at those responses, answering the question, what are the major challenges for discipleship in England and Wales today? Marvellous. Um, while we're taking this in uh, and what these words are, I think um, I'm going to ask Hugh uh, if he would respond first. Matthias, thank you so much for what you shared from the context in Slovenia. It's really interesting for us in this country to hear from another country that's addressing uh, some of the post-secular, post-Christian type of issues. Hugh, you've spent your life as a senior church leader in this country um, in the free church move movement um, with a real heart for renewal of the local church, uh, of course in this environment that, that of challenge that we've, uh, has been the backdrop really to our discussion so far. So what kind of discipleship challenges have you seen and experienced and how do they gel with the kind of words that we're getting on the screen? Well I suppose really I ought to say that I've had a bit of an overview of what's happening in England and Wales for the last eight years really because I've been the Free Churches President of Churches Together in England, which means that basically I've had responsibility for knowing where the Methodist, Baptist, United, basically everyone who's not Anglican, Catholic or Orthodox. So it's given me quite an overview. And one of the things I've noticed, particularly going through COVID and everything else, and even before that, is that when a church is, is failing, its first cry is, we need a discipleship program. 
And very often what people do, they reach out for a discipleship program as if it's going to be the cure-all. Yeah. And I just think that's one of the concerns that I've had, that it's not so much a program that we need, it's a discipleship relationship. And it's trying to get that into people's thinking that I believe has been absolutely crucial. So when I look at some of these things up here, and I think like apathy and busyness and all of these kind of things, yes, we are encountering that when we try and put on a discipleship program. But what we've got to do is to come back to what, what David was saying, which is to actually inflame people's desire so that there's something that's on the inside of them that wants this. Because otherwise, what we're trying to do is to shepherd dead sheep. And that doesn't work. And even if you try and sort of strap a dead sheep to another dead sheep, it doesn't make it alive. And somehow, we've got to have a desire on the inside of people that can actually drive a whole discipleship relationship forward. So that's what I've been observing, Paul. Yeah, that's a very powerful image, is it, isn't it? Um, quite shocking. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something about something needing to come alive and be awakened is what you're suggesting here. Now, Matthias, thank you for what you shared about Slovenia. I know more as we've spent some time together recently about your passion for your own country. But if you had done this kind of exercise, if you'd gathered church leaders together in a room in Slovenia and you'd asked this question and done a slido, would it have looked like that one? Yes, I, I think it would. I, I was, I'm not on internet, but I was thinking, I was trying to do the exercise in my head and some of these words came up for me as well, like time definitely, and, and then confidence, yeah, that's, th that's where my passion would come in. How do I help people to get confident, you know, because I, th that's one of the, I think, one of the obstacles is definitely people would like to do things, but they're not feeling confident, that they're not feeling competent, they're not feeling empowered, equipped, this so, kind of thing. So we're, 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 we're getting, uh, I guess, uh, uh, David, I'm going to come to you now, because we're getting this sense, aren't we, as uh, I'm listening, uh, Hugh, that there's a tendency almost to kind of prag uh, panic a little bit if we see numbers dropping off and go for the latest program. But actually what you're saying is it has to be relational. Um, and then we, we end up with um, a loss of confidence because it feels like the environment is hostile and we're losing. And we begin to lose confidence in the things that are actually central. Um, now, David, what is your commentary on these reflections? Because one of the things I loved about the way that you frame this whole thing is you ended up with this extraordinary vision that Jesus gives in that prayer of actually why, are we, why is there a desire at all? What is it that, brings, that, that is animating that desire? And it's that being drawn into the heart of the love of the triune God and sharing in that love and that love for the world. Are we failing somehow to communicate the wonder and the glory of that? That, that you know, how do you respond to this sense of we, we, we're, there's something that's not being quickened or awakened? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the, the, I mean, the prologue of John is just astonishing. You know, it begins with the deepest meaning you can have and it ends with the son in the bosom of the father, you know, in the, close to the father's heart as the NRSV translates it. You know, you know, the deepest love, you know, and in between is Jesus, you know, and, and somehow connecting up the deepest meaning, Jesus, and the deepest love is, is the trick, if you like, that, you know, what, what, but, but, but I'm also really interested. I, I just connected two dots, here, you know, you know, it, Immediately, I'm afraid, I think systemically, you know, and, and you know, you start making connections between these things and, and how, how they relate to each other. The, j just one line from lack of one-to-one -to, -one to mentoring. Uh, you know, that, that if you look at John's gospel, there's more one-to-one -one deep conversations in John than in any of the other gospels. You know, and, and th that's no accident. You know, yeah. the, the Nicodemus, the, the woman at the well, etc., the man born <coughs> blind and so forth. That, that, that you know, it's, it's what, what I think John is doing, you know, as the fourth gospel, yeah. you know, it, the church has, gr has, gr you know, has been developing for some time. They know the problems. One jo the letters of one John give you some of the problems that they were going through. You know, church always has problems. Uh, you don't mustn't get too depressed about them, you know, that, 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 you know, but, but, but John knew that 
to go deeper into discipleship, to mature in faith, which I think is one of the basic things John wants you to do, you have to have one-to-one -one deep, deep conversations. You know, and often, and for me, some of the deepest conversations have been around the Bible, around texts. Around, yeah. you, know, you know, deep texts give you deep conversations, you know, because often just one-to-one, -one, you know, you can get a bit, <laughs> you know, but, but, but you know, and, and I was so interested in what you're, it just rings utterly true. What, what like, do you say, those small groups? It, it, it's, it's like an anti-program, isn't it? It's yeah. the one-to-one. -one. Yeah. Um, uh, and Matt, yes, you did say this, didn't you? you uh, what you're finding, so, do you want to say a bit about that? that what it, are you finding that these... Uh, you talked about the sort of church being built again from the bottom up in this very close-knit relational Bible study. It's, you know, I, I remember this from, you know, my, uh, my upbringing in, in the 70s was, you know, um, Bible and prayer. Are we re do we need to rediscover yeah. and stop trying to reinvent? Yes, there's, it is this simplicity of like, yeah, a few people being with the Word of God and then opening hearts to God, opening hearts to each other and, and starting to wrestle with the thing because sometimes it's difficult. But, but if we can be really like in this love of God coming down in like John 17, you know, love from the Father. I, I think what you were asking before, uh, do we need, are we communicating it badly? I, I, would, I would rephrase that. I would say I think we are not modeling it because that's what it takes. Yeah. And if once we start modeling it, it's easy for it to flow. Yeah. That, that, that's my take yeah. on it. Modeling, not, yeah. yeah. Hugh, I'm going to give you the last word and then we're going to move to another segment. So, what's Yeah, no, just what's come out, I, I just really say yes to. I think modeling is absolutely important. And I think this whole question of life and abundant life, and when that abundant life is there, there's a connectivity with it. One of the things that has concerned me a little bit, you know, looking around the churches, everyone's trying to think outside the box at the moment. And if we're not careful, there'll be nothing left in the box. And, 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 and th there, are some things, there are some things which the church can do really well. You know, modeling, um, Bible study, all of these kind of things. And, you know, they may sound old hat to some people, but actually this is what people are looking for. And what the church is good at, we ought to be providing. And I think that's something that we mustn't lose sight of. Yeah. Yeah. Round of applause for our panel. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. Um, we are now going to bring in some different voices um, where discipleship, in a way, is on the front line. So we've been talking the perspective of the scholar and the perspective of the church leader. Um, now we're going to go and hear from those who are on the sharp end in different ways. Thank you so much, the four of you, for that rich discussion. And I love that. How do we come back to the simplicity of Bible studies, praying together, one-to-one, -to -one, small communities of faith, rediscovering the simplicity of the gospel? As Paul said, we're now going to continue on hearing from various insights, and this is where I invite Jessica up. And Jessica, you are a year 12 student. You can come up to the stage. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're studying French, religious yes. studies, and is it history? History, history yes. in Oxfordshire. Yes. So you're very, very welcome. You <laughs> are you. our Gen Z, Gen Z representative. So yes. <laughs> no pressure on that front, but over to you to share your story with us. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. You're not good enough. You're worth nothing without that A star. Your opinion is wrong. This is what we hear on a daily basis. My generation and your children, your family and your friends are in a constant battle against the world and we need your help. Hello everyone, I'm Jessica Dubok. It's great to be here talking to you today about the problems of discipleship for Generation Z. I myself was raised a Christian, but chose Jesus for myself a few years ago when I was 14. I have certainly faced struggles in discipleship, and so I hope I can give you a valuable insight on how to help your youth today. Perhaps you already have a list of flaws of my generation. Social media, mental health, you're right. But for a young Christian, these struggles multiply. As a believer, we are called to put the teachings of the Bible into action through the context of a modern British society. 
a society thousands of years ahead of the one which Jesus taught in, without the internet or culture we have today, where to be a good person is to have flawless grades, go to a high achieving university and have a successful working career, or perhaps a life centered around sport, trying to be the fastest, strongest athlete on the team. The first lie we are told is you are what you do. Life is packed full of studying, sport and socializing, and we've been told that this is the only way to make us happy or to be successful. Why is our character now solely being defined as this? Don't you see, Generation Z are chasing all of this, running into exhaustion and despair, and ultimately away from God. Coming out of the pandemic, everything has been put back into our lives. We were expected to take all the pressure from school and sport whilst juggling faith and discipleship. In lockdown, I spent at least 10 hours every week reading the Bible, worshiping and praying. Now I can barely attend one church service a week. This is partly because the world has shifted our priorities away from God, partly our fault, but partly the structure of our society. In the Bible, we are told we are loved first, before all worldly achievements. Jesus' parable in Matthew perfectly sums us up when he says, the birds of the sky, they don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly father provides for them. Quite understandably, teenagers are confused when a youth leader stands up and tells them that God loves them as he finds them, after they've just been told they cannot get accepted without that grade or that PB. We are called the change maker generation. And so while we love getting involved in serving the community, we must also be given the time to grow our faith. Just being in the church is often all we need. However, at the same time, we live in an instant world. The promises of God we see in the Bible took 40 years to fulfill. An average TikTok is 15 seconds long because that is how long a teenager can wait. <laughs> Waiting on God seems impossible. This is only the start of the battle with social media. Dietrich Bonhoeffer believed discipleship is about deciding which leader you are going to follow. And for young Christians today, this leader is not always Jesus. With everyone's lives at our fingertips, it's so easy to become engrossed into becoming like them. Not becoming like Jesus, but becoming like the image the world throws upon us. Thankfully, we do live in a more exposed world today, where people and views are heard, and more are educated on how to help others. However, the church is not equipped to help young people navigate through this. Your youth are faced with a relentless stream of questions, insults and accusations because of this stereotyped Christian the internet paints us to be. We are told our opinion is wrong before we even open our mouth. In school, 11-year-olds are asked where they stand on important issues, which they haven't even decided upon yet. How are they meant to answer? At this stage, it's like walking a tightrope, trying to fit the world and trying to fit the moral compass of the church. The ages of 11 to 18 are crucial in our development. And so when the online world is offering instant information that's accessible and comprehensible, but the church is skimming over these matters, who are we going to turn to? So we want to be educated on these matters so we can be equipped to face the questions and accusations from a Christian perspective. Like the armor of God talked about in Ephesians, we need the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Stop treating us like children who are sheltered from the world because we're not. Stop preaching on easy topics and you'll turn your attention to making us fit for this world, not yesterday's world. Stop hiding from these questions. Otherwise, my generation, the so-called face of the future, will hide from them too. Give us some voice in the leadership of the church and let us in on the conversations which affect us. So, 
you asked for the biggest challenges facing Generation Z. Firstly, the pressure of what the world thinks of us. Rather than God, who God says we already are, it's contradictory. Secondly, we need, to be the church, we need the church to be a shelter and a refuge where we are accepted and loved. Thirdly, you need to equip us to be disciples of Jesus today, not yesterday's society. Educate us on these questions and give us some space to explore our own morality. Please help us to grow into the next generation of disciples of Christ. Thank you. Wow, well done, Jessica. That was such an eloquent representation, wasn't it, of Gener Generation Z. So a huge thank you to you. And it really came across, didn't it, almost as a plea, a, a, a challenge to us. How are we, how is the church going to equip the next generation? And you've really thrown out some really helpful pointers for us to learn from you guys. We can't shy away from the difficult questions. We can't shy away from the difficult topics. How do we equip the next generation? Now, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Victoria, who's going to be talking to a couple of people. The first, about the church's response in the refugee crisis, and the next, a pastor who's trying to regather the congregation after the pandemic. Victoria, over to you. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for still staying here. So you're enjoying it. Thank you for staying. We really love you. And we'll be finishing very soon. And thank you, Jess, for really, really challenging us, um, in, um, telling us about the challenges that you face in being who God has created you to be in the community. And I pray that the churches and the leaders have been inspired and also challenged to be able to help you and work alongside you and make room, especially for young people in our churches and community, not just in the area of media, but actually in leadership, you know, because they have a voice, they have more to give than just looking after our social media system. And I pray that we're challenged to do much more. Thank you. And one of the, another area of challenge for us has been the unfolding of the refugee crisis in, in our community. For years, there have been newspaper headlines, as you probably have listened to recently, about migrants and asylum seekers and the way they are treated or whether or not they are welcome or, or not within the community. And it has been a challenge for the church as well. But we have with us today a wonderful organization called Welcome Churches who have a coordinated and inspired uh, way of responding and getting churches to be open-hearted to actually welcoming refugees in their local churches and making them feel welcome. So I'm joined now with me today with um, CEO Emily Shepard that I'm going to be interviewing. Thank you, Emily. Okay, thank you for coming, Emily. It's good to be here. A hard act to follow after Jess, I think. <laughs> um, so tell us, how has the refugee landscape um, changed um, over the last few years? Yeah, so as we all know, the last few years has been dominated by COVID and the landscape for refugees, particularly those seeking refuge in the UK, um, has changed dramatically and continues to change really. Um, so in COVID, um, the asylum system kind of ground to a halt during that time. Um, basically because the government weren't allowed to make anybody homeless during that time, um, which meant that asylum claims weren't getting processed. Um, and that, in, that resulted in the whole system kind of having a huge backlog. Um, and so now when we hear about people who are seeking asylum staying in hotels, that's because of that backlog and um, some brokenness in the system there. In the last 18 months as well, we have seen different groups of people um, come to the UK. Another challenge of the UK is that we, uh, the government try and give different groups of people different labels, uh, depending on what visa they're allowed to have, whether 
were, they're seen as being allowed to be in the UK or not. Um, but generally, they're all different groups of people who are seeking refuge in the UK in different ways. Um, so at the start of 2021, we were talking about people arriving in the UK from Hong Kong. Um, and we've seen a huge number of people come to the UK from Hong Kong um, to different different communities. Um, over 110,000 visas have been given um, to people from Hong Kong. It's called a BNO visa, a British National Overseas. Um, and so th it, that's the biggest mass migration movement to the UK since Windrush. It has a, a huge potential to change um, the landscape of our communities. Um, and then last summer, we saw um, the takeover of Afghanistan uh, by the Taliban, uh, which saw about 20,000 people come pretty much in a few weeks, really, in, in August um, from Afghanistan, um, who, who were evacuated out, out of there. Um, and of those, there's about 12,000 who are still living in hotels there as well uh, because of the lack of housing um, there. And then most recently, Ukraine has um, dominated our news um, and around 60,000 people have come to the UK from Ukraine. So huge changes, huge big numbers of um, specific groups of people. So before Hong Kong, we, the last time we had a mass migration like that was Syria um, in 2015. So to have a gap of six years and then to have three in one year um, is quite significant. Um, yeah. And then there's the politics as well. So it always dominates our news uh, and it has the potential to really divide our communities as well, in opinion. Thank you for sharing that. And in the context of discipleship that we've been talking about, um, uh, what does this mean you know, for us? What does it mean for the future of discipleship in the church community? What can we do? How yeah. can we support? Yeah, it's, there's so much and listening to the speakers who, who have shared already today has kind of reminded me of, of different parts of how, why this is so important to the church. Uh, from what David was saying about being learners and lovers and prayers being at the centre of our discipleship, you know, I would challenge you for this issue to learn what the Bible actually says about this issue. So it's very, it's very easy to say, oh, Jesus says, welcome the stranger, therefore we welcome the stranger. But this, the Bible is actually so rich in, it, in what it says about um, strangers. It's, you know, it says, welcome the stranger because you were strangers in Egypt. So it's, it's part of our story. Um, it says live as strangers on earth so we should have a lot in common with the people who are coming as strangers to our community and uh, yeah the well and god's church is for every tribe and tongue and i think there's a special blessing um of god's spirit when we gather the nations in in our church communities as well so um yeah and from what matthias was saying about bible translation as well it reminded me um the bible was first translated into kurdish i think it i was trying to remember it was around 2017 it was very recently and there's Kurdish people living in my community and there's probably Kurdish people living in a lot of your communities as well. Uh, and so it's only in the last few years that they have been able to read the Bible in their own language. Uh, and so that there's so many opportunities for discipleship in our communities. Many people who come to the UK have come because they have had to flee because of their faith. And, and many of those are for the Christian faith as well. You know, that can be anything from you, the, you went to one meeting, um, a one Christian meeting, and it just so happened that the secret police came to that one meeting uh, that you had to flee, um, to you've been following Jesus for years and years and then had to flee. And um, these people are looking for our church families, our church communities to welcome them. And one of the tragedies is that uh, there are people who are coming to the UK who have come because they want to know more about Jesus, uh, and they're not being discipled by our churches at the moment and they're falling away from the church when they've arrived because they haven't been discipled. So there's so many different challenges for our discipleship and so many opportunities and so many, much blessing for our churches when we get to know those who are seeking refuge here as well. Thank you so much. We are the light of the world and the salt of the earth and part of being that light and that salt is welcoming refugees and making room for them and being intentional about supporting them when they're in a, a new country. So thank you so much for welcome church. I love the name of your organization, so I think everybody should embrace it because the church of God should be welcoming anyway. Thank you so much. God bless you.
So I don't know about you, in my community, sometimes when there is a problem, any kind of problem, whether it's politics or there is flood anywhere or some people are dying, whatever the problem is, um, after talking about it for a few minutes, then the next will be, well, what are the church leaders doing about it? The churches should be doing something about it. The blame suddenly shifts from whatever it is that's been happening to the church leaders. So today, I'm going to be interviewing Pastor Kola Taiwo uh, from New Wine Church. He's going to come and talk to us about some of the challenges that he's facing or did face um, as a church leader in UK and how he's responding to the issue of discipleship. Pastor Kola Taiwo from New Wine Church. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for coming. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Victoria, for having me. Thank you. So you are one of those that, well, that will be described as a mega church leader, um, if they were to describe, you know, when they talk about mega churches. I know you don't like that, but we assume that you don't have problem because you're a mega church. You know, you have money. <laughs> you have everything at your disposal. So, you know, we want to know, tell us a little bit about what are your experience in leading the church at the beginning of the pandemic? Okay. Well, um, my experience started from when I took over as uh, the senior pastor of the church, bearing in mind that we were a church that within a space of 10 years, we'd gone through crisis twice, losing two senior pastors. And so when I, when I was ordained in 2018, the question is, how do you navigate this church? How do you settle the people, the questions? And so it quickly dawned on me that the uh, book of Hebrew tells us that God himself is speaking by his son, through his son, to the people now. And so for me, it was all about making sure that I could get the people to get a biblical response through this crisis. And so for us, it was almost like a preparation for the pandemic, because when the pandemic hit, we already had put some things in place. Uh, we, in 2019, we started a program whereby one chapter a day is all you had to read, or maximum two chapters uh, from the New Testament, and by June, you would have finished the whole of the New Testament, and then the back end of the year was the book of Psalms, and we've kept that going. And one of the things we found was that uh, the questions that people had were being answered through that. Now, one of the things I noticed, not just in my church, our church alone, but across many churches, was that when the pandemic hit us, it really showed us up. Um, the Bible says in the days of adversity, if you fall, it's because your strength is small. And it goes to show what we as leaders were feeding the people. Whereas God had already promised the people that he was going to give them shepherds according to his own heart. In fact, that according really means duplicating God's own heart by feeding them with understanding and wisdom. And so what you found out was that uh, we as pastors and leaders hadn't done a good enough job because our members were falling apart. They were fearful. In fact, not only was it just about the pandemic, but we had other noises uh, that, were, that crept into that fear. Uh, we had churches being divided over a vaccine or no vaccine. And you see that everybody was falling into that. It's because we lacked a biblical response. And that was one of the challenges that I faced and say, okay, the Bible has something to say about every issue of life. And how do we get the people to explore that? By going back to the Bible. Not creating programs because that was, that the programs were there to create an experience for the people, almost to numb them of the reality of what they're going through, but not giving a solution to the reality of what they were going through. Wow. Wow. That's powerful. Thank you. I need to eat that. I need to breathe on that. Thank you. <laughs> what did you discover, though, about discipleship during those days, and how did you encourage people to respond? For us, it was fairly easy. Mm. We didn't change tact. It was about, now, what could we do about encouraging people to read the Bible for themselves? Mm. And so we devised a simple program where we had all the leaders mm. spend, put out uh, audio for more, not more than three minutes on reviewing each chapter for the day. Remember, we had got this going from January 2019, and so by the time we got into 2020, when the lockdown kicked in, what we just released was every day uh, a three-minute summary of what 
uh, what it may be. I think we're in First Corinthians then by the time it started. And so people could go listen to that and that would excite them to go and read and reread the scripture. And the whole idea behind the audio uh, inspiration was the fact that as you read it and reread it, God had a word for you, particular to you. And I want to believe that the more you read the Bible from cover to cover, I mean, even if it's all of six months reading the New Testament, the Bible begins to question you. And you then come to a place to say, am I going to own up to what I've been asked? Am I living according to this or not? And then you've got a choice to make. And so I believe that as we allow the Bible to question us, we then begin to pray into what we're reading and rely on God himself through the Holy Spirit illuminating on the words that we're reading to change us and affect our lives. Okay, were there other particular resources? Oh, totally. And so we had done that for 2020, and as we were moving into 2021, we were thinking, okay, we're not going to change that. It's still got to be about the Bible. Mm. And then, obviously, through your relationship, we'd be able to, we ran the Bible course twice uh, uh, in the, among the church. I think the first round, we had about 350 members. Mm. Uh, connections actually because in some cases it was whole family units mm. making one connection on Zoom and we know that that really just rode on what we had been doing already and you can see the confidence of the people mm. yeah that really helped a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And as the church has, um, as the church has largely regathered on site what lessons of discipleship have you learned together in terms of missional um, work? Well because we did the Bible course, mm. it took us from Genesis to Revelation. And because of the in-house program of reading every year, the New Testament in six months, the back end of the year, the Psalms, there's no way you can read those books and in the Bible that you don't capture the heart of God mm. about missions. Yeah. In fact, he talks, the first missional statement out there is probably the one about Abraham. I will bless you and you'll be a blessing. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And that's speaking to us. Mm -hmm. And so we captured, and so then what then happened was that we have now spent a good part of this year just teaching on missions mm -hmm. and evangelism, where Jesus says, go mm -hmm. and make disciples. And I like how Professor uh, uh, David said it, that a, a disciple is a learner. In fact, some will say a scholar. Mm -hmm. And so truly, if we are scholars, learners, and followers of Jesus, we need to do that and then do what he says to us to mm -hmm. create or make other disciples. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's been happening. And we've seen the change uh, in our church in the sense that um, the people are no longer so much focusing on their needs, but rather focusing on God's needs. And I like the word desire. Mm -hmm. And so I like, it's about God's desire now becoming what the people desire as well. But we're not there yet. We still have a lot of people who, are, who haven't returned back to church. But those who have returned back are now confident and they're looking forward to what God has for us in the future. Thank you so much. And of course, um, in my line of work, I meet a lot of church leaders and different people have different vision for the church of the future. And uh, I just thought I would ask you that. What is your vision for the church of the future? I think the simple answer and the honest answer be is that no man can have a vision for the future of God's church except Absolutely. for the vision that God has laid out in scripture Absolutely. that we must walk in for his church. Yeah. Thank you so much. Come on, that's... <laughs> Join me too. Thank you, Pastor Kola, for your time. Thank you. God bless you. I'm now going to hand over to my professor, Professor Williams. Thanks so much, Victoria. Um, in our closing segment, we're going to ask you again to reflect on what you've heard. So if you go to the Slido, uh, if you're still logged in, um, please go back to where you were, slido.com, and then it's Bible Society. And there's another question there for you. Uh, what's inspired you as you think about discipleship? We've heard so richly, haven't we, from a number of different speakers. And we've just heard in particular from Jess and Emily and then Pastor Kola. Um, so what's inspired you uh, as you've heard those conversations, as we had those deep reflections uh, from uh, David Ford in, in the gospel um, for discipleship going forward? 
Now, while you're thinking about that, I wonder if I could ask David and Emily and Hugh to join me again, and we're going to talk about that briefly. I hope everyone's putting their, their words in, and we're starting to get... Um, some, some voting come up. I've got a new career, Jess, I think. <laughs> um, you might get more invitations to speak than you actually want. <laughs> um, enormously rich. Um, so let, let me um, start with you, David. What, what struck you um, in what you heard? You've laid out um, this amazing vision of discipleship from John. What, what struck you as you listened um, uh, to those other sort of experiences, really, of discipleship at the sharp end? Goodness, I, I have a set of notes down there. My wife always gets very annoyed with me. When she asks me what happened in a meeting, I say, oh, I'll have to look at my notes. You know, because I'm an academic, you know, I write down notes and then, and I haven't got them with me. But, 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 but you know, I, I, I think it was just, you know, John's opening key concept really is word and life, you know, meaning and life. And yeah. what I thought we got was just a beautiful succession of intense expression of meaning and life together. You know, in, 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 you know just, just each one of them really, really, really gripped me. And I loved the way the conversations went too. So, you know, I, it, it's, not, it's not, a, not, not, not just one particular thing, but... Um, just to say, I was sat next to David and I was reading his notes and he wrote down that TikTok, 15 seconds. So you learnt that, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> Actually, it's interesting how you go. You go <laughs> well, this is my children's world, you know, and, and, and it's extraordinary how, you know, Jess in particular just triggered off, you know, my children and their friends and younger, you know, the, the children of other friends whose kids are younger, you know, and so forth. And, um, and I think this thing about the transgenerational thing, you know, j just saying that actually you wanted to be in a church where there was that sort of communication. You, know, you don't want to be stuck in a bubble of your own generation. You know, you need to have that transgenerational conversation. And I, I am just so convinced that that generational thing in the Bible is so fundamental. You know, we need multi-generation in all sorts of ways. And I see it happening in various ways and it's so exciting when, when, when that happens, you know, because so much often youth work has been, you know, yeah. sending the youth off by themselves, you know, and, and the, 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 those, you know, I see my kids longing for mentors of older generations, you know, and they find them. That, but, but of course, you know, who do they find too? You know, that, that, that um, you know, we, we need to have those and how easy is it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we had this, um, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I heard so clearly, Jess, as you were speaking, my own daughter's, um, uh, you know, voices, uh, their hunger, your hunger to actually be taken seriously as a disciple. What a powerful thing. The desire is there, isn't it? And I think to me that is the most encouraging thing message for me actually was that you know there is a desire in the new gener in the next generation to be disciple to follow Jesus and that's the most important thing and that's remarkable and we got to respond to that haven't we I love the way uh, Emily you 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 pushed us into this theme of learning as well didn't you um, because there's a learning from the young there's a learning from the other I don't know if you want to say any more about that. Were you sort of um, provoked by other things that you heard? But there was, there was something there about learning from the other that I, I really love that connection that you made yourself back to David's um, yeah. summary. Well, I think there's learning from the other and then there's learning that we are all others as well. I think there's probably two, 
two sides of it, isn't there? I, last year in um, or the year before, I joined a Zoom with the Salvation Army, and they had a they were expert unpacking the earth, the theology around the ger, which is the the word in the Bible for the stranger and all that thing about us being strangers and welcoming strangers and the relationship between that and there is a huge amount of learning and probably not enough books written on that sort of thing really seeing as it's I th it's so in inherent to the Bible and to the story of God's people um, and yeah we learn by being with different people people who have had different upbringings to us we have such it's such a privilege to meet people from different backgrounds and different understandings of the world and people we have such a privilege in this country of people coming to the UK um, who have had different understandings of the world and different perspectives I always remember um, we were at this church meal and the intention was to have a meal for people who had who were seeking refuge in the city. Um, and there was one family there that were homeless at the time um, and being passed from hostel to hostel. And the, uh, somebody else who was also seeking refuge in the city, she said, they're homeless? They need to come and live with us. And she was seeking asylum and she didn't have any space in her house at all. But and everyone else there were, had probably one or two spare rooms, and, but n nobody else was the first to offer. It was somebody else who had had that experience for, the, for themselves. That, and it was such a challenge to me to like, see somebody's generosity more above and beyond what she could afford. Um, in, yeah, where you can just learn so much from other people as you meet them. We, we've had this setting that's been put before us several times, haven't we, by different speakers about um, the power of coming together in these smaller groups around a text and learning around the text. And I think one of the ways that this other kind of learning we've been talking about, the learning from the other and the learning that I also am an other, is we all have such different questions that we're asking of the text. And we will, when we're all finding, Pastor Kola, I love the way you brought this out, that the Bible begins to ask us questions back. And, it, and, and we will all experience different questions being asked back. That we're, we're going to miss so much if we're not doing that in these diverse communities. Um, so I, I love that. And I, Hugh, I wonder if you could speak to us, because we're, we're, we are pretty much out of time now. But we, we had this... Um, uh, you may have something that particularly struck you, but we, we had this thing at the beginning, didn't we, about the apathy and the confidence as the challenges. And as we've looked at the uh, inspiring, we've talked about igniting a passion and, grow, and, the, and the presence of desire. Um, I wonder, so, so that, that, that's been a real arc, I think, of our conversation today. But what about the confidence point? Is there anything, Hugh, that you would add into that? And, and its relationship to discipleship. Yeah, I mean, there are a number of things that sort of tie into this. One statistic that always concerns me is that the average age of the church worldwide is getting lower, but the average age of leadership is getting older. And it really challenges me. And when I was listening to Jess and thinking about how we actually engage, recognizing what each other brings, it really sort of struck me. And, and one of the things I've, I've wondered sometimes is that I, I was talking to um, someone who was the administrator within the Church of England. I was having a meal with him. And he said to me, I'm no longer managing decline. I'm maximizing opportunities. <laughs> and I thought that was such a great expression. And, and if I could only plant that in every leader, I think what we would find is that instead of trying to create energy which is really hard work, isn't it, to inspire and create energy in people, mm. we'd actually be looking for energy and releasing it. I think one of the things that we do as leaders, we get a little bit nervous at times about people that have got energy in our midst because we think that we might lose control. And yet, really, sometimes if we could release that energy, whether it's from younger people or, or from refugees or, or from wherever, and recognize that everyone's got something to contribute, and that really, you know, as leaders, we're meant to be facilitators. And I think in the early church, when I look at the way that Paul refers to the, the leaders at Jerusalem as being pillars, 
pillars in this building actually are just holding the roof up so that we've all got room to move around. If you've got short pillars, we wouldn't be moving around at all in here, would you? And I feel that the church does suffer at times from short pillars where we don't create enough space for people. So, you know, what I'm taking away from things like inspiration, jest, desire, all of those things up there, it really reminds me that if we create space, we're going to discover there's a lot more energy than we realized, whether that's in small groups or, or large groups. But, Hugh, there is something countercultural going on there, isn't there? Because you talked about the nervousness, where our anxiety, the lack of confidence, um, can mean that, you know, does, doesn't that connect? You know, Jess challenged us, didn't she, that um, don't, don't it simply teach us and equip us for yesterday's no, equip us for today. challenges. Uh, stop hiding from the challenges of today. Um, it, it's very frightening, isn't it, to sort of open up that kind of space that you're talking about. It takes a lot of confidence to go into an area, a question, um, a challenge that's new. Uh, how, how, you know, what's the key to that? Well, we have to do it. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I realize that one of the things that we do as church leaders, we always look up. Who am I looking up to? You know, and particularly in some cultures, I see that looking up is really important. You're always finding whose coattails you can hold on to. I've learned that if I'm going to stay relevant, I've got to look down. I've got to build relationships with people that are younger than me. And, and there is a risk element in that. But, you know, it's something that we've got to do. And I think that I have found that by, by relating down, I've actually got a lot of inspiration that's come into my life mm. and has made a big difference. And I think in the culture that we're in at the moment, I think that there is energy in the church, but I think that there's, there's a need to see that energy released and encouraged. And if we can do that, I think it's going to make a huge difference. Thank you, Hugh. Any last words from you, David and Emily? I became a grandfather four years ago, and it's been one of the most extraordinary experiences <laughs> I, can, I can have. But, but I really do think that, you know, we look at young people, you know, but grandparents have such an important role. Yeah. You know, what is the vocation of grandparents just now fascinates me. <laughs> <laughs> last word from only that I realized I forgot to tell you to join our network, so. <laughs> join, so welcomechurches.org, join our network. Do you do that. We, we have been enormously challenged, haven't we? But I hope we are taking away a sense of conviction. I know there's been a lot of sort of, um, my sense is that we're leaning into saying yes and amen to things in this room. But there is something that's really challenging, I think, that we've heard, which is to actually take a risk, be someone who, who can model something different in our communities, open up space for the young people, be willing to take the risk in addressing the kind of questions that they need answering, um, be willing to take the risk to open up to people who are very different to us, um, and welcoming the stranger. Uh, and Pastor Kola, you pushed us into the risk of, in a way, what, be what became, I think, in a previous generation, sort of old hat. But yet the power of the simplicity of studying the Bible together and allowing it to begin to shape us. And can we do that in these kind of intergenerational, diverse communities that will lead to really uncomfortable conversation, but really rich conversation? Those are the sorts of things, I think, that if, we, if we're encouraged and inspired today, can we commit to doing something to put that into practice? So I personally really appreciated all of the speakers. Thank you all very much. Um, Hugh and David and Emily, let's thank them. Also... And of course, Pastor Kola and Jess, but I'm going to invite uh, uh, Asoba Otogbi to come up. He is one of our church engagement managers. And as we land, we're going to give you, of course, a few pointers for putting things into practice. Um, so bear with us for a few more minutes. Thank you all to our panel. Woo!
great stuff from all the speakers. Wow. Um, thank you so much. That was awesome. Uh, for me personally, uh, what I'm taking away is, is that God does not just want us to know about Jesus. He wants us to become like Jesus through following, learning, loving, and praying. I heard life is a drama of desire. Desire goes to the heart of discipleship. Jesus makes deeper sense of life. Jesus is about desire. And the desire draws us into the journey of discipleship. And just you, thank you so much. A lot to take away. I guess you've heard quite a lot today and you're wondering, how do I take this away? How do I take all of this? We've got fantastic resources for you. Um, and starting, I'll just, that is David Ford, the Gospel of John, a theological commentary. Now, the prize you're getting today um, is lower than Amazon. <laughs> so, <laughs> Amazon rate. It's lower. So, and if you're online also, on the chat room, there is a link there to get a discounted copy. In short, before our prayer today, um, I overheard Paul Williams say, um, we don't just want people to buy the book, but we really want them to be reading the book. You know, it would be great if we can read that. So, it's a lot there to take away. So um, it's at the rate of 26 pound uh, instead of uh, 39.99. And online also you can get that. Exercise on mission, how Christians can thrive in a post-Christian world. It must read, it must read a book. I have personally read it twice. Uh, and I've heard Paul, <laughs> and I've heard Paul a, a lot uh, say a lot about that. Uh, um. <laughs> and then again, it's discounted. It's discounted, and I really will encourage you to grab a copy today. And if you're online, uh, if you're part of our online audience, uh, there's a link. There will be a link for you in the chat room. And also, we've got the Bible course. I'm sure a lot of us have heard about the Bible course. The Bible course will increase your confidence, equip you to read the Bible better, and help you to see its relevance to daily life. Over eight interactive sections, it combines video, teaching, group discussions, personal reflections, and daily reading. It's ideal, we've heard a lot about one-to-one. -one. It's ideal for one-to-one, -one, small groups, and large groups. Um, we've got some uh, manuals uh, in your takeaway bags. So we've got a lot of other stuff that you can take away in your, in your uh, 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 goodie bags. And so we've also got and the Frost, who is here with us, I'm going to quickly invite Andy Frost uh, up front here. Um, he wrote from decision to disciple, and the Frost is the director of Share Jesus International. Um, good to have you here, Andy. Um, over the years, Andy, I, I have worked with you, and I've seen you uh, a lot work with churches, um, sharing the gospel, the Christian gospel, how churches can share that in their communities. So my, 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 my question would be, when people respond to the gospel, Andy, what do you think are the, uh, uh, the hurdles that limit discipleship journey? Yes, over the last 20 years, we've been working with different churches, looking at how we can share and communicate the Christian faith. 
And the challenge for me is that many people often respond to the gospel, but then don't become disciples. This little book I've written explores five hurdles and how we as a church can begin to wrestle through what we do differently to really help people become disciples of Jesus as they make a decision for Christ. And one of them particularly is around the Bible and how we read the Bible. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you very much. And and this book is in your goodie bag. It's free to take away. And if you're online, there will be uh, an email uh, for you uh, to get the link uh, so you can download that on, online. No, I, that's, that's here. Online, you can... Andy? Yeah, great. How to nurture new Christians through the early stages of following Jesus. Then we've got the breaking ground, the church and cultural renewal, uh, weaving together theological insights, sociological insights, theological wisdom, and practical recommendations. Breaking the Ground by Nathan Mladin is an extended essay on the nature of culture, the dynamics of cultural change, and the church's role within God's mission of renewing all things. It's also in your goodie bag, and you can also get a link to download that online. So all of these are resources to help us uh, just continue to take what you've heard today forward, and we pray that God will continue to bless us as we continue this journey together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you very much, Osoba. I'm going to get Victoria to just come up and pray for us as we finish off. Thank you so much for bearing with us. We're slightly over time. Victoria, do you want to pray for us? Father, we thank you for this moment. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together to talk about you, to deliberate about how we can serve our community. What a privilege. We thank you, Lord, because we've learned so much today. But we just pray, Lord, that our desire from now on will be to be more intentional to disciple, to make disciples for you, and even as we continue as a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that as a light, we continue to shine your light in our communities, we'll be the salt in our environment, and we pray that, Lord, more than ever before, that the Word of God, the Bible, will take a central place in our society, our schools, our homes, our nations across the world, and ultimately in our homes, our family. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for coming. We've heard a lot. I think it's fair to say we cannot shy away from discipling the next generation, discipling ourselves. How can the church be equipping um, equipping us, equipping us in discipleship. I hopefully you've had a lot to think uh, and take away with you. Um, I don't know about you, but I think it's lunchtime, so I'm going to stop talking. Thank you so much for coming, and goodbye. Thank you.